Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Our show is authentic, honest, and it's trusted because everything's connected. Many thanks to those who've supported the show. It's deeply appreciated. It allows us to carry on our work and we hope others join too. If you'd like to help the show, go to thedennisreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. Hi, thanks for tuning in the show. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is Carl Duvenvorden. He's a lecturer, guest speaker, author, and environmental change expert. But more than that, and today's show specifically is about electric vehicles. Carl's had one of these for four or five years now, and he's worked through all of the bits and pieces necessary in order to make the switch from gas vehicles to electric vehicles. So, if you're interested, or it's caught your attention, that there's a change coming in how our cars operate, then this will be the show for you. 40% electricity generated in the United States is from coal-fired plants. If that follows, then 40% of EVs on the road are coal coal powered does that make sense <laughs> well it is true that the energy has to come from somewhere the electricity has to come from somewhere so in a perfect world the electricity that powers the electric vehicle is 100 percent renewable zero emitting so we would see that's why for example in quebec quebec of all of the canadian provincial grids is most heavily reliant on hydro in fact it's very close to 100 percent hydropower so zero emitting power and that means that when you charge your car in quebec no emissions as a result of that electricity and that's the reason why you would see strategically in quebec they have among the best incentives for electric vehicles because it's in their interests they get the biggest marginal gain in emissions when the, they can take a gas vehicle off the road and it's substituted for an electric vehicle, zero emissions. And it's true that if you've got a grid that is really, really dirty, the difference between an electric vehicle and a gas vehicle is pretty marginal. Hmm. So the real longer term solution is that the electricity to fire the car, to charge the car, needs to be green electricity. Mm -hmm. And it's fair to say that not all jurisdictions are there yet. Like, for example, here in New Brunswick, we're about middle of the pack in Canada. The jurisdictions with the dirtiest electricity would be Saskatchewan and Alberta. The cleanest would be Manit uh, Quebec first. And then Newfoundland is not far behind, Manitoba, B.C., and somewhere in the middle you'd have the other provinces. So um, we're kind of in the middle of the pack and yet we see the future coming where we'll be facing out Beldoon. And when Beldoon is gone, all of a sudden our grid becomes far lower emitting. So all that to say, renewable energy is the ideal for EVs. It's true. Thanks for that. Um, another thing that comes up is about the construction of the battery in the car. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into the exploding car fire thing <laughs> later. So this person gets into 68% of the world's cobalt significant part of the battery comes from the Congo. Um, there's mining there that has no pollution controls. They employ children. Um, they get into ethical supply chain that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. They also get into um, typical EV battery weighs 1,000 pounds, about the size of a travel trunk, contains 25 pounds of lithium, 60 pounds of nickel, 44 pounds of manganese, 30 pounds of cobalt, 200 pounds of copper, 400 pounds of aluminum, steel, and plastic. There are, there are over 6,000 individual lithium-ion cells. Does that make sense? Is that true? Is that accurate? And how do we wrap our heads around that? Right. It's true. First of all, we should know that everything we do has an impact. Yeah, that's missing from this guy's rant. Right? <laughs> everything we do has an impact. So it's good to gauge what is the manufacturing impact of, for example, a battery. And it's true. It's significant because those elements are there. Mm -hmm. And they come from all kinds of places all around the world. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for more and more of those. There will be impacts of that. There's no doubt. But at the same time, you could say, oh, but what about the vehicle I'm currently driving? That didn't go poof and appear <laughs> out of nowhere. Yeah. So 
everything has an impact. Yeah. And we should be cognizant of that. That's why, uh, to bring it back to a pretty basic thing, you know the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. The most important, always by far, is the first, reduce. And that applies to pretty much everything we do in our lives, including driving, yeah. right? And the number of vehicles that we have. Because in fairness, uh, when it comes to life cycle assessment, electric vehicles are far better than internal combustion engine vehicles. Right. They are far better. For example, when you look at life cycle analysis, that's the true, honest way to compare things. From the very beginning, manufacturing, the impact, all the way through to operation and eventual disposal. EVs have a larger manufacturing footprint than conventional vehicles. But their footprint during the operational phase is so much better than internal combustion engine vehicles, it more than makes up for that extra footprint at the front end. Because in a life cycle analysis of a vehicle, the biggest part of it is operation. It's when we're using them, the gas we burn. See, so EVs, a little more up front, but they make up for it in operation. So their, their overall impact is believed to be half-ish of an internal combustion engine vehicle. So that's one thing to compare them looking at the overall full life cycle. But the other thing to remember too is that it's great to say EVs are better than gas-powered gas vehicles. They are. But the best solutions, the first are still. So that would mean active transportation like walking or biking will always be better than the best EV. Taking the bus, it's going to be better than an EV too. Carpooling even in most cases is better than a person driving in an EV. And I think those are good background thoughts to remember as we go forward. EVs are way better than status quo gas vehicles. The ideals would be further uh, zero emission travel, carpooling, uh, public transit, and active transportation. And to follow a bit of that theme, because uh, the last star, the recycle part, uh, this guy's rant has touched us on that. The main problem with solar arrays, who's now drifted over to solar, is right. assuming that solar feeds your vehicle. Um, Mm -hmm. The main problem with solar arrays is the chemicals needed to process silicate into the silicone used in the panels. To make pure enough silicone requires, uh, and then he lifts off about 15 chemicals and acids and stuff. They also need gallium, arsenide, copper, indium, gallium, disimilaride, blah, blah, that stuff. All highly toxic. Silicone dust is a hazard to workers and the panels cannot be recycled for solar panels for housing. Um, so he's connecting solar panels for housing to charging your car with your solar panels. Mm -hmm. Trying mm -hmm. to that full cycle thing. Mm -hmm. Some of the research I looked up after reading this was solar panels can be recycled. Um, can you add to that? I, to be honest, I'm not totally up on where we are with solar panels. I know it's a concern. Yeah. I know going forward we will have a lot of them. I'm confident that we've got the brain power to figure out how to recycle them because I think the materials in them will be far too valuable to ever just landfill and assume we can go back to a mine somewhere yeah. for more. But again, in fairness, I would say, okay, so we, we will put this weight on solar panels. What about our other current forms of power? So building a coal-fired power plant, pretty big impact. Yeah. And when it's all over, a pretty big disassembly hmm. process as well to restore. Hmm. Same could be said even more for nuclear power. Good heavens, if you want to talk about toxic leg legacy, you yeah. see. So it's all fine to say that there are challenges perhaps with recycling on solar panels. But... Uh, other sectors have their challenges as well. And again, the benefits from solar, a lifetime of emissions-free power generation factors into that whole life cycle and it makes it compare very favorably. Mm -hmm. How about for vehicle batteries? Is it, is it mature enough yet? Probably not to recycle um, vehicle batteries. Is there, so at the front end of some sort of large scale social change, is there a window for also a change in philosophy and thinking and behavior patterns so that instead of just doing consumer disposable society from the 60s and 70s and the K-car, when Lee Iacocca invented the K-car concept and it's a disposable car, you know, we've got lots of materials, <laughs> and 60 years later, mm, no, we need to change our thinking. And in each of your responses, that was an underlying principle, was we need to change our thinking. So... At the front end of doing electric vehicle conversion and all the major manufacturers now announcing certain volumes of this new product, um, 
is the thinking changing along with it or is it just large-scale corporations trying to compete for market share on the next fancy gadget as opposed to you no know, recycle the parts recycle the batteries salvage this salvage that and teach the consumer lifestyle changes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you wander into that a little bit? Well, I'm sure the manufacturers are scrambling to get onto the market before it's too late. So there is a little bit of that market force driving things, I'm sure. But at the same time, all of these elements, for example, in batteries, are way, way, way too valuable to ever just mm. abandon and assume we can go back for more. So even as we speak, even though recycling programs are still being developed, there's a lot of effort going into that now. And it will, I'm, I'm certain, it will, have, it will produce fruition to the point where when we start getting into serious volumes of batteries being at end of life, we'll have a perfect channel for them to be disassembled, brought down to their constituent elements again, and put back into the process again because they're way too valuable. Hmm. Now, two, two added thoughts on that. One is um, batteries in vehicles, first of all, they're, they're warranted for eight years in the typical vehicle. So that means that if, they have a, if an electric vehicle has a range of X kilometers, it's going to deteriorate only a tiny amount. If it deteriorates more than that, it'll be replaced under warranty. So it's going to last for a long time. When it finally gets to end of life, where deterioration is an issue, and you say, you know, my range is really if uh, is is now lower, and it's not making the vehicle as practical. Uh, I think for many of us, we think, oh well, that'll automatically be be recycled. There's a good possibility that used car batteries will instead and and instead end up in big banks as grid backup batteries for our electrical power grid to help us attenuate the morning peaks on the power grid and the supper time peaks because you see all of a sudden a battery that's only working at let's say 50 percent capacity that's an issue when you're dragging it around with you all the time but it's not when it's sitting in a warehouse so that will be a second life for batteries likely and then whenever they deteriorate further to the point where they're not as valuable there anymore or practical that's when they would be recycled. And the second point I wanted to make was just earlier this year, there was a big announcement in Ontario that Stelco, a big company in Ontario, is planning a full circle recycling facility specifically for EV batteries. Mm. So you see, the market will respond. Those minerals are way too valuable to ever assume that we'll just get rid of them. The, um, what you're describing reminds me a bit of pieces I'm learning from the plastics industry. So there are several provinces that are revisiting the recycling policies and they put uh, almost all the onus on the manufacturer or on industry, um, industry responsible. So there's an acronym yep. that yep. goes with it. Uh, let me see if I can think of it. Yeah, yeah. But it'll come. Extended yeah. producer responsibility. Thank you, EPR. And um, so it's interesting that you're running a company and now you're responsible for how it ends up in the trash. And there's a side of me that wants to go, no, no, the person who put it in the trash is the one responsible. And municipalities have to really up their game and provinces on recycling. Because three years ago or so was the, the pushback from parts of China and, and Asia about we don't want your plastic anymore. So now you've got to figure out what to do with it. And I wondered if that was enough to make it valuable enough that then we do the full cycle thinking on this material um, the example is uh, PET that goes into plastic water bottles. Never needs to enter the waste stream because you can you can reuse it over and over and over and over. It's stunning. And there's one manufacturer, Ice River Springs out of Ontario, that set up its own recycling plant. It takes almost all the PET from Ontario to keep making their bottles. But that company had to branch out to create a recycling facility. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to, in order to do that when their main mm -hmm. focus was just doing you know bottled water in their case yeah. so will industry do they have to be forced into creating that full cycle can we get consumers to understand full cycle because the amount of waste that they generate in their households and and that gets to the culture change. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, there are, I think, a couple of ways of looking at it. For a consumer product like plastic, um, it's so many plastics are blends of materials. 
and the fact that they are blends make them make them what could be called monstrous hybrids. It's a word from one of my favorite books ever, which is called Cradle to Cradle. And it's talking about eliminating the concept of waste and designing things so that they can be fully recycled. And one of the points they make in the book is many of the things we we make now, we design them to be used and then landfilled, assuming that we can always go back for more. Cradle to grave. Yeah. And the premise of the book is we need to design things so that they are cradle through usage, back to cradle so we can dissemble them perfectly. And they say so many of the things we make now, we mix so many things in there, we make them f virtually impossible by design hmm. to recycle. Hmm. They're monstrous hybrids. And an awful lot of the plastics we have now are monstrous hybrids and that creates a nightmare for recycling. For example, those little sealable zippers on top <laughs> of a plastic bag, it's a different plastic than the bag. From a chemical engineering point of view, you probably need to separate them if you really want to recycle because you like to have pure streams. Well, we have such a mishmash in plastics. We have a massive recycling and disposal problem. And putting the responsibility back on the manufacturer would say, hey, I'm done with this package. Over to you to deal with it. And the manufacturer might say, maybe we want to just manufacture something that's a little bit more straightforward, not so monstrous hybrid-like, so that it's easily recycled, because all of a sudden it's our responsibility, and we have a self-interest to make it easy yeah. for us. Yeah. So that's why the extended producer responsibility is a nice, uh, a nice concept, because it puts the onus to act on the, the corporation that can actually do it. Because for myself as a consumer, I can do my best recycling. But if they're monstrous hybrids, they still are monstrous hybrids. And I can complain to the manufacturer, but I can't change the products. They can. And when it comes to vehicles, potentially it would be the same way. Except I have a feeling with vehicles, the market will kind of take care of it. We don't need to be experts in recycling because when you've got a big ticket item like a vehicle, uh, the, the vehicle, the, the, like the um, vehicle salvage <laughs> businesses, I would think, will say, no, we'll develop that expertise because there's way too much value there and we'll take care of it. Good. Great answer. <laughs> Let's um, slide into your personal experience with uh, your home setup that you've done with solar panels in your own personal electric car. and Maybe for a general audience, too, to, your journey might be uh, an example of a path to follow for a lot of other people who are just starting to poke their head up and going, you know, maybe I should pay attention to this now. If we do a deeper analysis of our carbon footprint, in fact, you don't even have to do a deeper analysis of your carbon <laughs> footprint. I can tell you, if you're a typical Canadian, there are two elements that will be the largest slices of the pie chart that is your carbon footprint. Those two will be your use of electricity, Exception being perhaps if you live in Quebec, because mm -hmm. it's hydropower there. But generally, for most of us, it's your use of electricity, and it is transportation. It's a massive slice of our, of our personal or family carbon footprints. The fuel we burn in all of our various vehicles, commuting, going on vacation, etc. Well... <laughs> Working as a speaker, a writer, and a sustainability consultant, it seems to me I have more credibility when I don't just talk to talk, but strive to walk the walk. That's a good idea. <laughs> so we've always strived to have fuel-efficient vehicles. But then a few years ago, as, as we started to see EVs appear on the horizon, I thought, hmm, I wonder when we're ready to take the leap. Hmm. And I, it was something I was looking forward to with great excitement. Hmm. But with the same trepidation, I think a lot of people would have in that, what about charging? What about range? What about performance issues, etc.? And range is always a big one. Yeah, I hear that all the time from people when they ask about EVs. So the first vehicle we got for our family was actually a plug-in hybrid vehicle. So it had a battery range of, it was a car that you plug in, but it had both an engine and a, an electric, electric drive system. So when the battery was full, I could go for roughly 85 kilometers on battery alone. And then if I needed to go further than that, then the motor would just kick in seamlessly. You'd be driving down the road and you'd barely notice it. And the motor would go and then you'd just watch your gas gauge the same as in any other vehicle. So no range issues at all. But a chance to dip our toes into the EV world. And in our case, where 85 kilometers would easily cover our daily commute 
it meant that as long as we plugged in every night and refilled, then essentially we were driving electric, except when we went for longer trips. And functionally, it worked out great. The vehicle was actually a Chevrolet Volt, Volt with a V. And it would go sometimes for weeks without the engine starting because we'd just drive on the battery, we'd plug back in, the next morning the battery's full, and we would drive again. And, and really, it was a beautiful vehicle in terms of it was powerful, it was quiet, it was sleek, uh, and it was just beautiful to look at. And, and, and the performance was great. Maintenance, virtually zero. Virtually zero. I think we had that car two years, one oil change. Hmm. And it was actually before its time, too. It was just kind of like, mm, it's getting on time. Maybe after two years, we should give this thing an oil change. <laughs> but it worked out very, very well for us. And initially, there were not a lot of EVs available in New Brunswick. So looking a, a bit further afield, I knew that in Quebec, there is a very good market for EVs because of very good provincial incentives. So, so that would mean a lot of new EVs would mean there'll be a lot of used EVs showing up on the market. So I did a bit of research and I found out you could find EVs pretty at pretty good prices in the Montreal market. So that's where I found mine. Went to Montreal, brought it, used it for two years. And it worked out great. Really, it was wonderful. And... After two years, then another model came out, the Chevrolet Bolt. And I hummed and hawed for a bit, but I thought, if I'm going to walk the walk, perhaps it's time to move from hybrid electric, plug-in hybrid, to fully electric. So because the Bolt, a range of nearly 400 kilometers that dealt with the range issue, mm -hmm. I was already familiar with the, just the pleasure of driving an electric vehicle and the low maintenance costs. So same thing, looked to Montreal once again, found the Bolt, and the used market again was very good because it was it was in that model I bought a 2019 in 2019 with just 20,000 kilometers on it as a used vehicle. So uh, so that's the vehicle we've now had for a bit over two years. And in the two years that we've had it, it's run wonderfully. The uh, again performance-wise, it's powerful, it's quiet, virtually zero maintenance. In the two years plus that we've had it, I've put $50 worth of maintenance into it. And that was only because I took it to the dealership and said, you want to just plug in your computer and run a diagnostic on this just to see that everything is good? And they did that, came back and said, everything's good, and I paid $50. And that's the only maintenance I've done on, in two years on this view. Yeah. So it's worked out really well. Now, I will say, with the pandemic, the landscape has changed in that there are now supply chains issue, chain issues and you won't find those used vehicles as easily anymore. And the prices have gone up too, just on account of supply and demand. But the good news is the cost of manufacturing EVs is going down and it's expected to hit parity with regular gas vehicles within the next several years. Like even, for example, my Bolt is a 2019. The 2022 bolt when they uh, announced it issued it unveiled it they unveiled the price it was over four thousand dollars less than the 2021 it's an indication of when, when companies get better at manufacturing them yeah the prices go down so we can expect more and more of that as more and more evs appear on the market and companies just get better at manufacturing them the availability of used ones um just this morning, there was a post uh, I caught on social media. A local used car dealer's got 10 Teslas, um, used Teslas for 2019s or, or so. So I thought, oh, that's the first time I've seen that popped up and use the ad space to promote it rather than the, the usual vehicles to promote it. But that, That's refreshing, isn't it? We, yeah. Because all of a sudden it speaks to dealers, which are the gateway to the automotive world typically. Yeah dealers starting to come on board saying this is the future i yeah. better and i can appreciate where, you know space. new brunswick's a small market by comparison to most major markets so typically it'll roll out somewhere else first mm -hmm. but how interesting to see it slowly trickle here mm -hmm. and i can still hear some of the naysayers you know can't get their head around a, another format of vehicle or <laughs> of no it still has to be a gas engine because it's the most efficient and I, I, I get the sense, you know, change is tough. Change is tough for all of us. And um, there's a quote by, I think it was Marshall McLuhan, 
that went something like, when faced with the option of accepting change or needing to prove the reason not to change, most people get busy with the proof. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah, it's, it speaks <laughs> to, we're usually comfortable doing what we're doing. Change is tough, especially big change yep. is even tougher. Yep. So all of a sudden, along comes this notion of electric vehicles, and it challenges what we've been driving all of our lives. Yep. So our instinct is to dig in our heels and find out all the reasons why we shouldn't do it. Like, for example, the earlier litany of problems with batteries and <laughs> yeah. solar panels. Classic uh, examples of that type of behavior. When in reality, we might do well just to say, just to give that a try. Yeah. I would challenge anybody who, who is a naysayer about electric vehicles, go for a drive in one. Yep. And then tell me what you think. Because it's my experience that most people who very quickly will give those types of knee-jerk reactions never even sat in an EV yeah. and don't know the real world and, and often will forward information that just feeds their current beliefs already as opposed to exploring, well, what's the truth out there? Let me find a real owner yeah. and get the real scoop from them. So I know that you've had the Inconvenient Truth training from ages ago. And I always slide back to that movie because in there is Mr. Gore is going, what is it in 2006 that China already knows how to do to meet California emission standards for vehicle production that our big three do not know how to do? So how is it China is already meeting these standards and our big three say it's going to take us to 2025 before we can do it? I know there's politics and economics and stuff all involved with that. But on the surface, that's such a simple question. We used to be the innovators. We used, to, you know, for the country's identity. We used to be the ones that could move forward with new things, and and we can't anymore. While electric vehicles come along, they become a pretty large example of that. Mm -hmm. But the consumer still has to make the sh <laughs> the shift mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. to oh, I want to treat it this way instead of that way. And it isn't necessarily just a virtue signaling thing too about I want to love my planet or love my earth. It's actually a a really good economic argument for it, too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting in the course of having worked in sustainability for the last dozen plus years now, Dennis, <laughs> I have learned, uh, I mean, I learn every day, of course. Yeah. I learn every day. But one of the real aha moments for me was when I learned about the whole field of social marketing. Mm -hmm. And social marketing, not social media, social marketing. And it's essentially analyzing why we do the things we do and what is needed in order to change behaviors. And one of the biggest things in social marketing is behavior and uh, barrier analysis and removal. So in other words, let's say that we want, we know that in the larger picture, whether for fiscal, government fiscal reasons or whether for environmental reasons or other legitimate reason, there's a behavior that we would really like people to do, but they're not doing it. Uh, to, in order to try to get our heads around it, Barrier analysis and removal would be a good strategy in that we look at, well, why are they doing what they're doing and not doing the better option? And we come to realize it will have to do with convenience or time or a bunch of other legitimate issues. So then you say, okay, I've analyzed the barriers. How do I get rid of those barriers? And as soon as I do that, because you see, as soon as doing the right thing becomes the easiest thing to do, everybody will do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you remove the barriers and all of a sudden people will do it. So I would say, for example, when it comes to EV adoption, I think there is room for policy on the part of government in terms of saying to manufacturers, you need to get into this space and you need to allocate a certain number of your vehicle vehicles put to market into the space of electric or something like that. You know, the government has the ability to poke manufacturers to say, hey, get on with this because it's a big deal. We really need to do it. But from the consumer adoption point of view, then the barrier analysis might say, well, they're expensive. Aha, federal incentive, provincial incentive. Mm -hmm. Right? And then a few other things like that, a little bit of deeper analysis, de deeper um, analysis of the barriers. We might come up with a few other reasons. We say, oh, not enough charging stations. Aha. Massive charging infrastructure programs so that we improve the number of charging stations around. We implement it, incorporate charging stations into the building code. So new apartment buildings, new homes will all have a charging station at home already just by virtue, just as they, as they already will have fire alarms, for example, or something like that, you see. But barrier analysis and removal, we work our way through to that. Mm -hmm. So there's a real government role in that 
to help make doing the right thing the easiest thing to do. Mm. In some of the slides you gave me to prep for this, um, talk a bit about um, charging stations. So, because it ties to range. So some people right. will be hesitant about, well, 200 clicks, and I don't know if I want to go to St. John or back, that kind of practical thing. Right. But it's well past 200 kilometers now on a charge, and there is all kinds of charging stations available now. That's right. So I'll, I'll do a quick little overview of how it works for charging an electric vehicle. There are three levels of charger, three options essentially for charging an electric vehicle. Level one is just a wall outlet, a standard wall outlet, the same thing you plug a hair dryer into basically. And it just means that because that's a lower supply of electricity, it will take longer to charge. But I can tell you, for example, for myself, having an EV now for the past four years, we just charge at home from a wall outlet. We don't drive the car empty every day. And generally speaking, the amount of power we'll get from a wall outlet, it's a slower charge, but that amount of power is enough to replenish the battery for usage that we have on the typical day. So that's level one, just a wall outlet. Level two is 220 volts. So that's the same level of power as, for example, a dryer or a stove or a hot water heater in your home. And that would be the type of charger that would fill up a vehicle overnight, typically. So, for example, you see a lot of level two chargers at hotels because people go to a hotel overnight. And I can tell you for myself now, having an electric vehicle, when my wife and I travel, we seek out hotels that have chargers. So that we limp into the parking lot with a low battery <laughs> at the end of the, at the end of the late in the day. Mm -hmm. We plug in, and the next morning when we get we go on our way again, the battery's full. In many places. Many hotels have free chargers at this stage. <laughs> that will change, yeah, I'm that sure. Because I was thinking, what, what would that cost you on your hotel bill? But. It doesn't cost on the hotel bill. And in fact, to fill up a, a, a battery like on our, in our Bolt from empty to full is about, I think, 6 or $7 <coughs> worth of electricity. So the hotel's paying a small premium. But on the other hand, they get us as clients because otherwise we who knows where we would stop. So that's level two, 220 volts. And then level three are what are also called DC fast chargers. And they are for when you're going a long distance and you want to charge quick. So you don't want to wait overnight. You want to charge quick. So they have about 500, 450 or 500 volts and a really big cable that you plug your car into and then you flip the switch and they will fill up vehicles. It depends on the vehicle. Teslas tend to be really quick on fast charging. Uh, my Bolt tends to be a little bit slower. So, so for example, uh, my vehicle might be uh, up to an hour to do 80% full. But then it just means that when you're going on a trip, uh, let's say if you wanted to go from here to Montreal, I've gone to Montreal or to Ottawa several times to visit family with the EV. And the network is really good, especially in Quebec. So virtually every exit, there is a level three charger. And you just go plug in for a half an hour, coffee break, bathroom break, that type of thing, a touch longer perhaps. Hmm. And then you're on your way once again. So, um, and, and, and using them is very easy too, because obviously the cheapest place to charge is at home in your own wall outlet. And functionally, I believe the stats say that it, between 80 and 85% of EV charging happens at home. So even though we all worry about range and charger infrastructure, we do most of our charging functionally at home. Mm -hmm. But uh, in New Brunswick, we have what's called the e-charge network operated by NB Power. And there's a smattering of charging stations all around the province. Most of them are level three chargers, the fast chargers. And, uh, and, and, and to access them, you have a swipe card, the same idea as, so let's say, a coffee card at your coffee shop where you load the card with a bit of money mm -hmm. and you just swipe it, the machine unlocks, you plug in, it automatically deducts for the time that you've used. And the card that's used in New Brunswick is like a bank card interact, you know, on many banks. It's, it works in Quebec networks, in Ontario networks, that type of thing as well. So the same card, just swipe, swipe, swipe as you go. So instead of a gas card, you have an electricity card, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, that's right. And you just top it up as your credit card every now and then, and away you go. It's very, very simple to use. So for your pioneering experience, it sounds like in the model of changing human behavior, most of those obstacles have been addressed. Just not a lot of people might be aware <laughs> that it's it's opened up that much that quickly. Because uh, this conversion's happened in a 
two to five year window, roughly. Yeah, it's. I, I think that is true, uh, but I think there's still a perception that there aren't enough chargers. Mm. I think there's generally not a lot of awareness that most charging really happens at home functionally, mm. and uh, and there is the notion that the, that car EVs are too expensive. I mean, all those things are changing, and whenever parity hits once again, mm. you know, already already EVs are so much cheaper to operate to operate than gas vehicles, especially when gas is a dollar eighty a liter now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're already so much cheaper to operate, it's almost no contest. When they become cheaper to buy, hmm. even yeah. the, the most skeptical person will be persuaded because why would you buy a vehicle that's more expensive to buy and more expensive to operate every hmm. kilometer hmm. than these beautiful alternatives that happen to be better for the environment too? And if I could, I'll, I'll share a little comparison I did recently yeah. between a Chevrolet Bolt and a Honda Civic. Sure. Now, a Honda Civic is a pretty fuel-efficient vehicle. Mm -hmm. But I thought, hmm, what is the, I, I know that EVs are cheaper to operate, but just how much cheaper? And I know they're more expensive to buy, but how does that compare in the bigger picture in terms of cheaper to operate and what's payback, that type of thing? So I looked at the list price of a Honda Civic and a Chevrolet Bolt, both 2022 models. And then the fuel consumption, emission production, all that type of thing. And the bottom line was, the, they're fairly comparable cars. They're both mid-size. The Civic's a pretty efficient vehicle already too. But the bottom line, in terms of cost per kilometer, the Civic was a bit over 12 cents. The Bolt is two and a half cents. One fifth the cost to operate per kilometer, just comparing gas versus electricity. When you drive 20,000 kilometers a year for each, you'd save over $2,000 in the Bolt. Hmm. Apply that to the price difference between the Civic and the Bolt, because the Bolt is more expensive even after rebates. Hmm. But you apply that to the difference and you find that the Bolt pays for itself in two and a half years. Hmm. Most of us keep our cars far longer than two and a half years. Hmm. And that's not factoring in maintenance, which would further uh, benefit, come down in, in favor for the Bolt. Plus, if gas prices go up more, that payback gets even shorter. Carbon tax? So far, we're immune. Uh, EV, EV drivers would be immune so far because carbon tax hasn't tra translated into electricity rates. Yeah, because as gas prices go up, there's, that gets wheedled into the conversation pretty quick now with uh, impact of carbon tax on gas prices and people looking for a break um, from all of that. And I thought, well, EV just simply bypasses that whole thing. Totally. Hmm. Interesting, eh? Mm -hmm. um, here's, if I could too, here's, here's something else that I think is exciting in the future, Dennis, yeah. and that is that in New Brunswick we're getting smart power meters, right? There's been a discussion. The smart and meters, sm yes. Smart <laughs> meters coming. And the thing is, smart meters enable measurement of when a homeowner is using electricity. So from the perspective of NB Power, the utility, it will help them see uh, on, on each household's usage how much was used at particular times of day. And in the big picture, NB Power has a hard time providing power. Not a, doesn't have a hard time providing power, but it has two daily peaks virtually every day. And that would be at breakfast time, we get up, we take our showers, turn on the coffee, make toast, turn up the heat big peak every morning. Mm. And then we get home again after work and we turn on the, the cook stove, lights, heat, electronics, etc. do laundry, and we have another peak then too. It's really expensive for NB Power to manage those peaks because they have to find electricity or fire up a power plant that might be their most expensive or dirtiest one. So in many jurisdictions, time of day power rates are offered so that at certain times of day like those peaks power is more expensive it reflects the true cost of generating that electricity but the flip side is at other times of day power rates get way less hmm. and and many areas have time of day pricing like for example in Ontario well the over they have three levels of power rate the peak power the two daily peaks uh, the time in between during the day is mid-peak, and then overnight, when there's all kinds of surplus power available on the grid, 
the rates are the lowest. That could be on the horizon for New Brunswick. And if it were, that would be a really good thing for EV owners because you see then you would program your vehicle to charge overnight when power rates are lowest. Mm -hmm. It's essentially like getting your gas discounted mm -hmm. as you're filling up at the cheap times. Mm -hmm. It's good for the grid in terms of balancing the load. Yeah. And it's really good for EV owners. But it will hinge on time of day rates coming, which are possible once we have smart meters that can measure those peaks and valleys. There is a lot of pushback against smart meters. Do, do you know why? I mean, it's like with everything. You find one or two examples and you generalize it over, well, all of them will explode or catch fire or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever Saskatchewan ran into with their issues around smart mm -hmm, meters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it sounds like... There's multiple moving parts at the same time that are slowly starting to find the new pattern. So that would tie to how you integrate electric vehicles into your daily routine now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, if, I, if I could, Dennis, yeah? I think the same arguments against smart meters would be the arguments against EV adoption. Yeah, and well, maybe uh, the solutions, again, would be finding find out what barrier analysis and removal. Yeah. And as soon as all of a sudden... Uh, a price difference makes it worth it for people to change their behaviors and do things outside of peak hours. Yep. You yep. say, wait a minute, what's not to like about this? Yep. You know, if I can do my laundry for virtually free overnight, why wouldn't I do it when I would do it at twice the price if I wanted to do it for convenience during yep. the peak? Using price points to change behavior. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because at some point the consumers or the household's got to be... <laughs> got to be implicit in this whole exercise because there's millions of us and if we all change that little bit it's a huge change somewhere else massive yeah uh, sp speak a little bit it's sort of connected because it gets into power rates and stuff so nova scotia back in january and nova scotia power made their announcement about creating a surcharge i believe it was for <laughs> solar panel um, people and within a day of solar installer industry was saying how many cancellations they had or how many pauses they had for people looking to do something they thought was good, but not if we're going to get this flat fee because Nova Scotia Power is losing revenue because of people generating their own power. There's a movie, I'll forget, Robert Redford's son, Richard Redford, um, made it. It's a documentary around 2016. It's on Netflix. I'm just blanking on the title of it. One segment of it had to do with Nevada, in 2016, 2017, changing their legislation with a three-person appointed panel from the power industry um, to create a, a surcharge on people with solar panels. And the way that documentary went, it showed it buried the solar industry for about three years. Like thousands of people were suddenly out of work. Um, thousands of households, more than thousands of households now had to pay this extra fee. Because the same argument that Nova Scotia Power made, we're losing money when more people put solar panels on their house. Do you have a, a way to muddle into what the solution for that is? Because in some ways, the rooftops of every community are a resource of infrastructure <laughs> for placing solar panels on them to then help in power meet its 2020 green energy mm, obligations, which it didn't meet. Right. It's fair to say that the, the coming of, of home generation, decentralized generation, is a massive disruption for power grids everywhere. It, it just is. And so I understand that their reaction might be, well, we have to, to stem this or recover profits from it or somehow be compensated for the challenge that this gives us. What was done in Nova Scotia, it seems to me, was uh, without having analyzed it in great deal, but having watched the conversation from afar, it seemed it was terribly ill-conceived. It seemed it was totally knee-jerk. It seems it was done without any consideration of the economic industry that they have there in terms of solar installers and all of those jobs. Because it seems to me what you said was true, that all of a sudden this policy, had it been implemented, would have just stopped the industry dead in its tracks. Hmm. This at a time when climate change says we need this not just trotting forward, galloping full speed ahead. Yeah. So it's fair to say that utilities are grappling with a lot to manage. 
it's fair to say that a, a, something as was proposed in Nova Scotia is not the solution at all. There's probably a middle ground there somewhere because utilities still have to be self-sustaining. If they're not self-sustaining, we'll have issues the first hurricane that comes along and trees fall on lines because they weren't maintained or some other reason like that. So there has to be a middle ground. I'm not a policy expert, but I would say don't do what was tried in Nova Scotia. It will totally stifle the industry, which is in its infancy, and we so need that inf in industry to grow. Hmm. But find a middle ground that allows for that to become a significant part of our grid while paying its fair share and that everyone, that, that everything works. Hmm. Hmm. In the new model. Right. Yeah. The word disruption gets floated a lot, right? <laughs> it's totally disruptive to yeah. conventional biz business models, just as EVs are disruptive to the conventional car dealer model. Yeah. Yep. To, uh, we have about five, seven, ten minutes left, depending on what we want to use. Um, I want to go back to you and your personal experience um, with, with the conversion and in any advice or tips or suggestions you can give for an audience person who's on the cusp of trying to figure out, do I do this or not do this? And uh, you've wandered into the deep end on a bunch of pieces. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about the other pieces that complement that main piece about, you know, a household deciding to buy their first EV. Um, but y you've done it for four years. So, and obviously you're a fan or else you, you wouldn't have done it. But mm -hmm. you've made the switch and you had a particular background to help you with making the switch. Now we need to share what Carl went through in order to to be really happy with what we're doing and then moving, you know, this is the way we're going to do it from now on. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. other people can have confidence with your path and forge their own way into this transition. Right, right. Well, I would say for someone thinking about EVs, uh, get ready and do a bit of research. You know, you don't have to be a professional researcher, but just... Check around on the internet and start looking at some sources out there that can give you a bit of guidance in terms of which vehicle to choose that might be right for your needs. For example, there's a resource out there, and if I can remember the website right, but I had provided it to you, I believe, EV Plug and Drive, I think it's called. But it has a search tool in that you can indicate what your needs are, and it will identify the vehicles out there now available that best meet your needs. So that would be size of vehicle, range, that sort of thing. So it's a valuable tool. And it's good for someone to go out and just explore a bit. Okay, what is out there? There's also a great website <coughs> with Natural Resources Canada with fuel efficiency ratings of every vehicle sold in the country, not just in 2022, but 2021, all the way back to the 90s, I think. But there's a way in that, in that search tool where you can single out all of the battery or plug-in hybrid vehicles, and then you can see all the models that are available, and you can do comparisons in terms of their range, in terms of their efficiency, but they're all efficient. I mean, every electric vehicle is efficient. They're crazy efficient compared to any gas vehicle. So, but you, but you can compare them in terms of their range. That's one of the big things. And then you can go out there and browse and find out what their prices are. Now, it's fair to say right now there are supply chain issues for mm. EVs. There are supply chain issues for every vehicle. Everything, yeah. You go around town and you look at any any car dealer's lot and there's nothing there. Yeah. So it seems like the model is shifting a little bit where once you've decided what you want, then maybe you need to go into a dealership and, and put yourself on the list to order. And there's a backlog, you know, six months, eight months, something like that. But I think the big thing would be do a bit of research so that you find out what's out there that meets your needs. Here's another thing as well. That is, it's my experience that all EV drivers love to share what they know and what they've learned, both with other EV drivers and with anyone else who's interested. Some would say, we'll talk your ear off. Right? Kind of so, like the show. <laughs> kind of like this show, right? What time is it? Either? No, it's great. Um, so um, there are some great groups out there. For example, there is an NVEV Owners Facebook page, and it has hundreds of members. Many of them are EV owners. Many of them are people who aspire to own EVs. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful forum for information exchange. Hey, has anyone had experience with and people will pipe up and answer. Can anyone help me with this? I'm wondering about how these chargers work. What's the best home charger if I want to install one in my garage? It's a great forum. 
I know I'm a member of another one that is national. It's Bolt owners hmm. all across the country. So information specific to Chevrolet Bolts, the vehicle I happen to drive. Hmm. The NV group is specific, is all EVs. But those information opportunities are out there now. Hmm. And for anyone who's interested, generally those groups are really welcoming and there are all kinds of good people on them who are really knowledgeable and who are willing to share what they uh, w willing to share what they know. Hmm. What's the most fun thing about your car? The acceleration. <laughs> Still 16, 17. Oh good. my. <laughs> you know, it's I, I say it's like a, a tiger, even though I drive it kind of with the claws pulled in. Yeah, yeah. But it's very interesting that, in particular, from a stop, electric motors have full torque instantly. So particularly from a dead stop, if you've got a passenger and they've never, in, in, I shouldn't in. be saying this, should I? <laughs> if, if they've never sat in an EV and you're just sitting at a dead stop and it's safe and you take oh, yeah. a look all around, and then if you put it to the floor, it's kind of... <laughs> G-forces in your car. It's, it's, I mean, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah, there's no shortage of power in an EV. That's nice. The other thing too would be quiet. I just mm. love that it's so quiet. Mm. Mm. Never tire of that. Does it feel like you're in a science fiction movie? The only place we've really seen these has been in various, you know, movies where they try to show you what it's going to be like in the future, and the the self driving taxi cab that's super quiet. And just, does it feel like am I really in 2022, or am I in a some other 20? 50 kind of thing <laughs> well i i don't feel that it feels very normal to me by now okay. if they make one that flies then, <laughs> then then maybe it'll all feel differently but you know i will say i am amazed how quickly all this development has come because it was really not very long ago that i was driving my little toyota echo and our other vehicle was a little toyota yaris and and they burn fuel not a lot mm. but i was aspiring to thinking my heavens my transportation footprint how can i reduce it and when are these evs coming well lo and behold that wasn't so long ago and they're here now mm. right and mm. change happens exponentially too so if the last five years have brought a lot of change just imagine what the next five years will bring mm. Mm. Right. We're going to see so many differences coming, and it's it really, it's a great new world, the world of EVs. It's interesting that in many cases, when we think sustainability, for some reason, we start to think sacrifice. Tesla broke the model on that one, right? Because all of a sudden, when you thought sustainable vehicle electric Tesla, there's no sacrifice there at all. <laughs> I mean, they're gorgeous vehicles, first to market, and the others that are joining them too, wonderful vehicles no sacrifice hmm. that's going to help yep wonderful experience to drive an ev great place to end yeah thanks carl oh it's my pleasure dennis thanks it's fun and thanks for watching be good have fun love each other